everyone and welcome back uh, to another episode of Nuggets Don't Cry. Um, this is a Craig Newby uh, special. He's uh, an all black, he's a barbarian, uh, he's a gold medalist at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, could go on, but we've only got about half an hour. Uh, how are you, Craig? Yeah, we're right, eh? we yeah, just had a good um, off air, I suppose. Could, could meet up with the boys and um, yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, got last week of school holidays before back went into cricket term, which is pretty pretty good and the sun's shining, so can't complain too much with life. Lovely. Um, and always, and as always joining me for this interview is Mr. Ollie Webb. How are you? I'm buzzing, Chappy. The, the heart's thumping. I, I'm very, very excited, um, but uh, I'm looking forward to this now. So. And uh, joining him is Mr. Graham Crawford. How are you, sir? Hello, lads. I'm very good, Chappy. I'm very excited for this tonight. Very excited to meet you, Greg. <laughs> uh, as always, we'll start with our wee traditions. Uh, Graham, what drink have you got for us today? I've just got myself a wee cup of tea, so keeping it handy today. Lovely. Uh, Ollie, what about yourself? Uh, well, there's a heat wave here in Galway, so I'm on the IPAs for the second day in a row. Um, <laughs> and I'll probably roll into the weekend, but it's a, a lovely little number from Little, so good job. And this new thing, it's a, a coffee tea bag uh, from Safi Coffee, made from Ugandan farmers. Uh, very, very good, and I'd recommend it. Uh, it's absolutely delicious. And Craig, what are you going to be sipping on? Well, uh, I've got a ginger cordial at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, like I was saying earlier, this um, Thursday is my start drinking day of the week. I try and get all my work done Monday to Thursday, and then try and stay on the straight and narrow, but and I'll, I'll have a couple of beers tonight after club training. Um, we've got a really nice balcony set up at Wimbledon and um, the boys come up and have a feed after rugby and uh, yeah, we'll have, a, we'll have a beer or two maybe, but the clubs out, clubhouses are closed at the moment, so we've got to be a little bit careful on, on what we can and can't do, but I think we're a bit uh, more relaxed than Northern Ireland, I think, at the moment. We're, pubs are open outdoors now and you can get in groups of six outdoors, so it's, it's actually a little bit more lenient, so Looking forward to making use of that, but uh, sadly, just the ginger cordial. Uh, I noticed that yeah. Graham's got. I noticed Graham's got his cup of tea and just a blank um, cup cup. I was wondering if he's looking out for some sponsors or something. At some stage, maybe someone wants to sponsor you guys. What do you think? Yeah, potentially get a KFC sponsor. Yeah. That would be the dream, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I won't, no, no, no money from no money in the southwest London, mate. For you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think, um, so, Craig, yeah, friend, uh, we maybe they have a friendship match. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are at the moment? Uh, pretty simple story, really. I um I grew up in New Zealand. On a, I'd moved to a farm when I was about eight or nine. I think that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Just um. Getting out of the city, I was kind of a high energy kid. I think they diagnose it with all sorts of stuff now, but I was pretty, pretty full on and loved just being outside. So I think the farm was probably a making of me. Um, went to a good high school. I had to catch the bus into school. Went to Rotorua Boys High, which has quite a good tradition of, um, of rugby. We won the nationals in '98. We played Otago Boys in the final actually against Richie McCaw's side. Um, and we scored, it was 5 all in the final. Uh, we, I scored our try, Richie scored their try, and we had to share the spoils, which is pretty, there's no extra time because it was a TV match. And yeah, so I, I played just played cricket and rugby at, at school and athletics and tennis and just played everything else. And then got to about 18 and sort of took my rugby a bit seriously. And I got a trial with the New Zealand Sevens. Well, actually, I didn't get a trial, I got to fill in. Um, for a weekend, they had the trials in, in Rotorua, and Gordon Titchens was the coach, and he. Um, he invited me along to just fill in some numbers and just make up a few, you know, put a bib on, and, and I went pretty pretty good, I think, and I ended up getting in the team. So that was kind of my start to professional rugby. Um, and I hadn't even left home. I was, I, left, I was leaving to go to university two months after that. So I went up to Auckland to university, played for North Harbour. Then I got transferred. I was at the Blues, and that didn't really work out for a year. I got transferred down to the Highlanders, and that was probably the best thing I've ever done in terms of just a cult, real cultural fit, um, real hardworking people, just friendly, right on the coast, loads of farms, just good people. And I think that was probably the making of, of me as a player, really. It taught me a lot of leadership stuff and 
Um, I had pretty, you know, did okay. I think you mentioned in the in the um, uh, in the intro there. I played um, for the Barbarians. My one only game for the Barbarians. I, I played against Ireland of all places in Gloucester. Um, yeah, so that was that was good. I scored a try right on half time and hurt my neck quite bad and spent four days in Gloucester Hospital with it in bloody brace and that. And that was, um, but yeah, that was that was good. And then my last test for the All Blacks. Um, well, I might not have been my last actually. A test against the All Blacks. I played against Ireland as well, so I've got good, oh. good, good fond memories of playing against Ireland. It's always tough. Try. Played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real tough one. I think was we're twenty points up. I think so. Real close one. Yeah, but mate, the one at Soldier Field still um, obviously rings in everyone's. Recent memory and uh, Aaron Cruden, was, you know the conversion game. I'm sure you boys remember those. And I think the, the, the you know, just the standard of Irish rugby is just you know come on really you know, leaps and bounds. I mean playing Leinster in the Heineken Cup final in, in Murrayfield, and that was the start of the you know, real stranglehold on uh, on European rugby. So um, I got a good concept of of Irish rugby, but Ulster and I've never been to Belfast, so the Ulster thing I guess is the most recent. Um, Positive news for me and part of my my journey on onwards to where I want to get to. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I started on a farm and now I live in a city and moving over to Ireland in a few months. Fair play. Brilliant. Yeah, plenty to talk about there. Uh, Ollie, do you want to get cracking with the questions? Uh, I do. Uh, Craig, um, you mentioned Road to Real Boys um, High School there, and I have a, a special pair of trousers to show you here. Um, I hope you can see them. All right. Um, okay. I, actually, I I ended up working there for a year, um, from 2018 to 2019. I was over in, my uncle was living in New Zealand in Rotorua, and I ended up uh, living and working in the, the school, in the, the hostel there. And they, they talk about you very highly. Your name's on uh, many, many walls around the place. But uh, my question is basically, um, was rugby always the route for you? Because obviously this was the, uh, the amateur days. And uh, were you always destined to be a rugby player or had you any other aspirations or... Anything else going on? Um, now, I always, uh, I don't know, it's weird because I always wanted to play for the All Blacks. When I was a kid, I remember um, I remember just wearing the All Black clothes and I'd go down to watch Bay of Plenty. It was my local team. And I, I remember going down, the old, the old man would take me down and you'd run on the field and get signatures and collect the program. And um, so I always wanted to be a rugby player, but you're right, it was amateur when I was a kid. So there was no real drive to be a profession. It was just you played rugby. You went down Saturday. You played rugby. That was what you did. Um, but I was always interested in cricket. Cricket was one of my big passions. I, I played rep cricket all the way until I was about fifteen or sixteen, uh, and then I sort of lost the passion for it. It got a little bit, I don't know, boring, and I, I got quite good at rugby, so it sort of took over. Um, yeah, there was a point where I guess cricket was probably my main sport. Um, I think one of the other something happened to me i was on a um i was on a farm with my mate um ian and we went out shooting um we're shooting birds with a air rifle so we're on a bit of a walk and we we're coming back and he long story short he shot me in the leg and i ended up in hospital for a week and had an operation and I, it got me right in the calf and I, I was probably on crutches for about three months and i didn't really do much sport and then when i came out of that and returned to sport um, I started playing fly half um, instead of, I used to be a sort of a back row and I played fly half for a couple of years just to stay out of the tight stuff. And I guess that at that point, I really enjoyed rugby and getting the ball in my hands and gave me a bit of a balance. So then, like I said about that seven story is, is true. I remember sleeping on the floor in this hotel. Eric Rush was the captain of, of New Zealand and I was sleeping on the floor of his hotel room for three days and did this trial. Um, and, and that was it, really. I suppose rugby was my pathway, and, and there was money in it for me. And uh, I was lucky that I got into that squad. I suppose otherwise, it, I would have just been. I was going to university to try and be a physiotherapist. So okay, end up working out. I did a sports science degree in the end. Uh, well, you've always had the sporting sporting interest, then. I think so. Yeah, I wanted to be a carpenter when I was young. My granddad was always doing stuff in the shed. We're making things in the shed. I wanted to be a carpenter. Um, cool. So yeah, still a bit of an amateur one, I suppose, but um, not as a, as a profession. And then I guess full circle, eventually I'll go and I'll get a farm and uh, 
and raise things whether they're alive or they're plants. I don't know, I'll raise something, probably a bit of a mixture. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Graham, have you a question now next? Hi, yeah. So, Craig, you said seven Bantiff teams. I was just wondering, uh, what's the actual, is there, do you see any difference in the seven Bantiff teams in the terms of lifestyle, really, outside of it? So, a lot of travel. Oh, seven, so. Yeah, so the, other than the, the, the difference in style of game, you know, like there's no hiding in sevens, you've you got to be good at you can be good at passing, catching, and tackling, and then you're quite fast at something, or quite smart, or you, you know, you've got something super. Then, then that's a game for you. I think it's a really good grounding for young young people. I know Ireland now take sevens a little bit more seriously, and it's a real good transfer of some skills. Uh, Lifestyle-wise, was outstanding. I was at university. I would um, we'd go into camp probably on average once every three weeks, do a one a week camp, and then go away for a week, and then you'd come back and. The lifestyle was outstanding. I was sort of 19, 20, traveling the world, getting a little bit of cash, not much, but a little bit of cash. And um, so it was pretty, I was like a professional university student, just train, drink, play, repeat. And it was pretty the cool. And then, yeah, 15s, you couldn't you couldn't really get away with that as much um, just because it was, it was full time, it was professional. And um, you know, had to pick and choose, I suppose, your battles and on and off the field. So. I certainly enjoyed the lifestyle when I was younger. I, I don't think I could have done it for a lot for that long because I was, yeah, I don't know, kind of, once you grow up a bit and you've got a few life goals as well, I think sevens, now now it's professional, but then it was just amateur, semi-professional. You got paid per tournament, really. So yeah. um, I learned so many lessons, met some good people, played with Jonah Lomu because of sevens. If I hadn't played sevens, I wouldn't have played with Jonah. Um, yeah. So pretty, pretty lucky, really. Yeah, you're living the dream. I wouldn't fancy tackling him in, in training now. That would be a tough, a tough man to be paired with. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, right, boys, partner up. Who's going to go with Jonah? And you're like, I used to go. Jonah was one of those. He was a superstar. Obviously, 94, he played for the All Blacks. So I, I made New Zealand Sevens in 98, and he was a world star then. And he used Sevens for fitness and went to the World Cup. And uh, but he couldn't. We went to the World Cup in Argentina, and he couldn't go out outside of the hotel. We just got swamped, and we'd go, you know, wherever we wanted on to the beach, or we'd go for a walk in the town, and wow. no one had a clue who he were. And, but he he was, you know, it was in a place called Mar del Plata. But he was um, he was an amazing bloke, and just um, it, I think I didn't treat him differently. Me and another guy, Justin Wilson, we were both young from both from Rotorua, and we didn't treat him anything any different, and we just sort of. We hung out with him, and I guess we were in awe of him. But he—he he was quite good, um, real generous guy. We used to get us because he was sponsored by Adidas, and we were Adidas, but we weren't. He used to just buy us whatever we wanted, and he'd come into camp and he'd have like three pairs of socks and or three hundred t-shirts, and he'd just hand them out. And we went to this. Um, I don't know if I'm digressing, guys, or whatever, but I'm just rolling with some stories here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. We went to um, we went to this Adidas factory in Argentina, and he and he, the, he had organised the guy. It was actually quite almost like a game show. He said to the guy, "We went in there, and the guy gave us everyone. You had ten minutes, and you could you, you got this massive bag, and you had ten minutes to do as much like as much as you wanted." And um, everyone it was it was carnage. Everyone was describing. I remember describing like football jerseys, like um, River Plate, and. Um, Barcelona and whoever else was, was just getting all these football jerseys and and then they Have shipped still it. got them to this day? I think I will do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were all yeah. obviously replicas or whatever, but um, I remember just getting so much stuff and then they shipped it all back to New Zealand for us because we couldn't carry it around. Um, and then on the same trip, we um, we got on the bus after we'd been at a hotel and the, the hotel guy runs on the bus, stops the bus, hang on the window and goes in there and um, a few of the boys had stolen the bathrobes from... Uh, the hotel didn't realize they were so the guy had to come on and get us off the bus and get all our bathrobes off the bus and them all back i think that was yeah probably me Quality. <laughs> but seven is awesome ever, mate. I love it. if you've ever any excess gear lying around we'll, we'll not be too far from belfast and we can we can come pick it up now and any day yeah, we what size are you looking boys you're all probably small I'm a bit oh, bigger than small. Uh, extra large for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
just the large yeah, yeah. Health, but I'll take, <laughs> I'll take a medium too. <laughs> so you boys all are you all playing rugby at uni or are you just all supporters of uni or rugby or what? What's what's the crack with you guys? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're we all play a bit on the side, like, but we're all just playing for the uni team, so uh, nothing too serious. That's a yeah, we had we had a we had a good a good run in our, our schools cup. We got to the the Ulster schools cup final. Uh, we all went to school together, and uh, since then it's gotten a bit less serious. But we all we all still play as much as we can. But uh, during COVID, good. it's not ideal, of course. But no, are the um are the clubs are back up and running at the moment, or is it still locked down for them? Uh, it's still still locked down at the moment, so um, just just the professional game at the moment. So, are you guys running on um, like Ireland as a whole, like Republic of Ireland? Are you running on their rules or are you on England rules? Uh, it's a bit of a mixture. I'm actually in Galway, so I'm in the Republic, so I'm oh I'm right. with them. But then the North has its own rules again. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, all very confusing at the moment. But hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll just be able to start fresh next season and hit the ground running. That'll be the hope. Uh, so. Oh, have you got uh, next question there you want to ask? I do. I, I stick into the sevens, actually. Um, I saw you were competing and actually won the Commonwealth Games in 2002. Um, but I was just wondering what the buzz was like around the village. Were you mixing with other rugby athletes or just other athletes in general? Were you, was there a good mix or was it fairly sticking in your team, sticking in your bubble around the Commonwealth? Um, so we... It was quite because rugby is one of those. Oh, I don't know. We got there first, um, and you're part of your New Zealand team, so you're with the rowers and the netball and the lawn bowls. Actually, as a one of the lawn bowls, Kiwi lawn bowls guy, he finished his. So some of the events started before the opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. So some of the minor sports or some of the, the preliminary rounds, and, and the, one of the lawn bowls guys got um, he got bundled from his event before the ceremony started, and he got real pissed up, and he got he ended up got got done for some kind of uh, I don't know, he got sent home anyway but we got there on day one of the whole thing and we went to the opening ceremony which is pretty cool but we were, we were right in the village and then we trained near yeah, would walk out of the village to train which is quite close um, in Manchester and we were so it was so many distractions um, not voluntary ones you weren't looking for them but just so much going on you like just you, you walk Walk past like some some of the athletes, you know, and you just like couldn't men, women, you know, it was just we weren't we were rugby players, you know, we were like fit and healthy, but they so we got we um we moved out of the village um about a week into it, uh, we were the last of two days of the whole thing, so we we moved out into this countryside hotel. I don't think that was planned. We just were too distracted. It was too. <laughs> there was people say. If, I don't know, cycling guy or something had won a gold medal or something. It was just parties going on and it was a real yeah. was positive but a really weird atmosphere. Like some people were there that like that just by getting the game to the games was their pinnacle. And so we wanted to win it. So we, we moved out and then we came back in. You had to be in the village while you competed. So we came back in the day before we competed. Um, and then we, we were lucky enough, we won the gold and um, we didn't we didn't even make it to the closing ceremony. We we got on this bus back to the hotel to get changed and um, we ended up on the bus with some Kenyans and we just, we spent about an hour and a half on this bus just driving around the city, just doing, we'd sing a Maori song or a New Zealand song or Waka or whatever we'd do and then they'd sing their song. It was just unreal. We just, so we never even made it. And then we ended up back to New Zealand. Um, we spent a lot of time with the New Zealand um, athletes, so not just the rugby guys and that. And we spent a lot of time with the New Zealand, the netball girls. Um, one of my mates who played for the Blues when I was there, a guy called Jeremy Stanley. He was an All Black. His now wife, but then partner was she was captain of the New Zealand Silver Ferns team, and mm -hmm. so we hung out with them. There was a there was a story. Um, so the New Zealand netball team had this little. Um, it was like a kiwi bird. That folded up into a netball, and when you open it up, it was a key, like it was a multi toy thing. It was like a soft toy, but you could fold oh, it into a netball. And they used to, it was called Wiki, and they used to take it to their games and put it on the side of their games. I don't know if they still use it, but they used to have this every game for about 10 years. They'd have it next to them, it was there like their mascot. And we were in the village um, like lounge thing, me and another guy, Craig de Goldie, who was in the Sevens team. And we, I stole this thing off them. They left it in there, so I stole it off them. And then we, um, 
we were sending them ransom notes, like saying, oh, you need to send 10 <laughs> bars of chocolate to the to the badminton team. Uh, and then I'd send the 10 bars of chocolate and then we'd send another note. And we we're like writing with our left hands, doing like using crayons and cutting magazines out. It was quite cool, eh? And then they got to, they played, they played two or three games without it. And they were like, properly bricking themselves like well we need this we're starting to get into the semi-finals we need this get we need this thing and so and we they um, in the games uh, without the mascot so they won all their games without it and then the last thing we did we we said to them they had to um that's a there's a there's a new zealand flag pole in our village in our part of the village up on this pole and we said they had to um like take the flag down and hoist up a load of pairs of uh knickers and bras <laughs> put that up the pole and then we'd give it back and they didn't know it was they, they came through and they were doing like handwriting tests and they were looking through our rubbish looking for like any clues it was pretty cool it was, it was awesome anyway we we eventually they did this bra thing and um but like they were giving like they'd have to like we'd say oh you have to give the um i don't know the cycling team a massage or you know like we just we weren't trying to detract away from the rugby boards but they kind of knew it was us but had no proof and then we eventually gave it back and then they played the final and lost with it so we kind of blamed Jeez. the fact that they had it oh you should have kept it yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, my yeah. village was unreal so yeah, yeah it was we... free drink free drinks free food free anything haircuts oh it was unbelievable yeah, it sounds like some ex some experience there. it's more part um, than i thought there would be yeah We'll, we'll focus here a bit more about your uh, rugby union career now. Uh, so you're a man from Rotorua, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, if my geography is correct, you'd be a Chiefs fan. So what was it like playing for the Blues and Highlanders? And uh, who's your super rugby team you support? Um, yeah, it's funny. Eh? Like I grew up in the Chiefs area, but I didn't support the Chiefs. It was, it was quite weird. Um, I always supported... Um, Always supported the Highlanders. Um, I wanted to go to university down there, to physio school down in Dunedin. So I, I don't know what was weird. And then ended up, um, I don't think I got the grades, so I had to go to Auckland University. Um, but it wasn't weird. It's just weird. Where are you? It's your, it's your environment. You once you get in somewhere and you meet the players and you, you stay in a culture and a, in an environment. That's one of my big things now as a coach is, is about the environment. I'll try and touch a little bit on what Ulster's really impressed me is their culture they've got going. You know, they're very accountable for each other. They, they're hardworking, they're smart. Um, you know, they've got some loads of young, old talent that is just working really well. So that was something that I really enjoyed from my time in the Highlanders was that envir environment side of things. Um, and I guess that sort of shaped me as a, as a coach now and how, how it was important. You can't just have the best plans. You've got to have the best people. And, um, you know, I've got to believe in what you're trying to do. Um, so that was that was different. I know the Chiefs now that they're they've um, they're very about their culture, their Maori culture, and and all that sort of spiritual connection. So uh, they they run a really good ship down there. I I do support them when they're playing. You know, anyone other than sort of the Highlanders, I suppose that that would be my team. Um, and then, funnily enough, I've got a bit of an, a, an affinity with the Stormers in in Cape Town. Um, when we used to tour over there, it was always the best place to tour, and they were. Of all the foreign sides, they were the ones that would host you the best, you know, always inviting into different um, parts of the town and always good for a beer and a story. And, and they, you know, so I, I kind of sort of support the sort of Stormers from afar, really. Um, okay. Yeah. Let you go next, Graham. Yeah, so I, I can imagine there being quite a big difference in Super Rugby in the Premiership back then when you played, but... Did you feel there was a big difference when you played Super Rugby and Premiership? Um, it took me a while to really... Like everyone says, oh, what's the difference? And I'm like, well, first of all, the difference is the Prem is nine or ten months long. And you, it's a war of attrition, you know. You've got to have big squads and you've got to learn how to grind out games when, when you know, you've got internationals away or you're... Um, you know, playing at home against someone lower than you, just grind out wins and get through and try and manage your body. So the biggest difference was was just intensity of training and, and enjoyment factor. I think New Zealand was all about can you enjoy training? What can you can you get the best out of it? It was loads of gameplay. It was probably quite high intensity. Whereas English, 
training was quite low tempo, quite high physicality, but low, lower tempo because you, you just couldn't train at that intensity or that mental side the whole time. Um, so I, I found that was a real big difference. And that, I, I guess, transfers into what um, what the focus is, you know, like you can't be in the prem or anywhere really now, but in the prem without a scrum, without a maul and a good defence. So there was a lot of focus on that um, in New Zealand. But my sorry, my first year at Leicester, um, Tom Van Dell was a winger. He scored something like, say, 14 tries. Second top try scorer was penalty tries from scrums with like 11. I've been involved in my whole career. I've been involved in one penalty try from a scrum in New Zealand. So just the mindset was a little bit different. I think it's shifting now to, to you know, moving the ball and not saying kicking isn't a big part of rugby because it is, but I think New Zealand, the shift the mindset from like being risk adverse to being actually positive mindset was, was shift. Uh, I remember Thomas Waldrum coming to, to Leicester and he was brilliant. Um, his first year, players, player of the season from all clubs voted. He scored something like 18 tries. He was averaging three or four offloads a game. Like he was crossfield kicks for tries, grubber kicks for other people. He was like just played free, but he would have made for every two good things he made one mistake, and that wasn't good enough for Richard Cockrell. So he drum, drummed into him like you know, like if it's not on, hold it, and let's just be safe and let's play the phases and stuff like that, and. Eventually, he he you know just became less of a player, and he ended up going to Exeter, who gave him that that empowerment to play like he wanted, and he and he scored something like sixty five tries in under a hundred games for them, so or hundred games. So I think the mindset back, particularly when I played, you know, was was around percentages and risk adverse, rather than this is, if we try this and it works, then what's the benefit? I think that was a real big shift. Much much better to watch as well when players are taking risks and throwing those offloads and just makes a better game from a fan perspective. Yeah, I think so. Like it'd be hard to coach at times. You'd be like, oh, why have you done that? But then with so much transition, and don't get me wrong, New Zealand teams kick a lot. You know, there is a lot of kicking, but it's if the ball's changing hands a lot, then there's going to be opportunities for the for the attack and. Um, yeah, it is. It is good to watch, but I mean, you look at the like the European stuff over the last two weekends—the Challenge Cup and the and the um, Champions Cup. The, the games are unbelievable. Mm. Like the skill level, the intensity, the it's test match, test match footy. It's yeah. you know, it's brilliant. And um, once this time of the year, you know, once you get winter out of the way, there's some great games. You watch April games in Premiership or the Pro 14. It's just a different level of you know. In, there's just energy on the ball. Mm. Definitely. Uh, I've just got a question here. Um, you've obviously got you've, your achievement list is probably too long to name. Uh, what are you most proud of? And then on top of that, was there much pressure playing to the Barbarians as opposed to the All Blacks? Because I know it's meant to be a very relaxed, free-flowing team. But is there still a lot of pressure for you to play in the day? Um, I'll start. The first one is that my most, my proudest achievement, I guess. Um, just transitioning from from sevens to fifteens because not you know it is popular for not so much for forwards but um, so I guess transitioning and making a, a good career of it after I finish so I, I kind of I feel proud that I worked really hard when I was young and, and got the rewards um, personal achievements I, I like winning things were always cool but I, it wasn't really why I played for the amount of friends I've got now from rugby that I that I still keep keep in contact and that I think that's probably one of my biggest achievements that I would be con, you know hopefully be considered a good person and and someone that you know always gave his best so uh, looking back as a player that's that's you know your peer respect is really important um, and then what was the second part of the question I forgot uh, uh, yeah was there much pressure playing for the barbarians Oh, pressure for the barbarians? No, no, not at all. I got a call, I got a phone call, and um, from I don't know who it was, the barbarian guy. I don't know who he was, and he just rang and said, "Look, we want you to come over and play. We have got Ireland and England in, a, in test matches. Do you want to come over?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm in." And me and my mate Tom, 
Tom Donnelly, who coaches Otago now, he um we were both invited, and then another guy called Sassinia Nessie from the Chiefs. So we flew up to Auckland, and then we flew over from Auckland to, I don't know if we went through LA or not, I can't remember now, but we got to Heathrow, first class, champagne the whole way, wow. just going crazy on the beers and that. It was good. Got picked up in a taxi straight to like a reception sort of lunch thing, and it was just beers. And so there was absolutely no pressure um, from the barbarians. And we got, um, in those days, you got cash. Like there was no bank transfers. It was just, you got an envelope of cash on day one. And um, as it turned out, my mate Tom, the day we're leaving, he got called into the All Blacks to cover for someone who's injured and he couldn't come over to Barbarians. And then he only was in the All Blacks for two days. And the guy that was injured, so it was Christian or something, he got, he was fine. So Tom didn't come to, come to England and he didn't get to play the All Blacks. So he got a bit ripped off. But um, the pressure, I actually, I actually, I played rugby for enjoyment and for like training really hard. The old adage of, Train hard, play hard, drink hard it was kind of me, and not always the drink, but I would always get away from rugby. Like I was into hunting and fishing and farming, so I'd get away. You know, when it was time, if I had a day off, I wouldn't sit at home playing PlayStation or watching TV. I was out forward driving or shearing sheep or, or fishing for a day or whatever, and got up to loads of mischief, um, fishing and drinking and hunting and stuff. But I, I was kind of a that. So I really enjoyed that barbarian thing was pretty much like that, I suppose. It was pure rugby. We we didn't do very well against Ireland. I think the score, the score was quite big against us, but um, yeah. I think we beat then we beat England the next week. Um, good ma- good man. Points. But anyway, so but then the All Blacks was different. You know, it was they were going through a shift in their culture. I don't know if you've read the um, book Legacy. Um, no, I haven't loved. Uh, well, if you can, you know your, your students should be able to read by now. But get this book. Get this book. I've, I've got it. I've got it. I'll see, flick, Jack, you flip me your address, and I'll send you this book over. But it's called the Legacy, mm-hmm. and it's where the All Blacks went through a transition of old school backseat on the bus kind of coach tells you what to do, and just go and do it. And they were had a real culture of um, like fear of failure rather than fear like, rather than the excitement of of winning or excitement of performing. So Graham Henry and Steve Hansen went through a re- real transition period and I was mixed up in the middle of that. I was sort of the start, I was the, the start of the end. Not that I don't think I was, I was part of the whole problem, but I got caught up in the, they brought in the no dickheads rule and they brought in the, you know, like getting away from the old bus trips, you know, beers and yeah. bus trips kind of. So I think I kind of missed the real positive change of that just the way my form was and I was obviously behind Richie McCaw and um in New Zealand rugby so I, th- I think the pressure was really high then it was really driven by the players and I don't think I enjoyed training as much as I would have if I was in the All Blacks now I think it would be a way more positive environment for me yeah. so on reflection my time in the All Blacks whilst it was enjoyable and I'm extremely proud of it I think I learned loads of lessons as a leader of how to or, you know what? What actually people should be treated like, um, and setting an environment. And so that's something I've taken again into my coaching. Is it's how do you get the best out of players? And it's empowerment. It's asking them how they feel, how they should do something, what should they do, and putting it back on them, and and just sort of making it more f- enjoyable. You're like it's it's a job. It's hard. It's a hard job. If it's not fun, you you're not going to perform as well. And I think the All Blacks went through that when they. You know, like they went through that transition and became very consistent. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to take a quick break here um, and we'll come back for part two. We'll just touch briefly then on your uh, coaching career and answer questions as well. Uh, so keep listening for part two. This week's episode is sponsored by NI Baby Scan. Thanks to their state of the art equipment, NI Baby Scan offers expectant parents the chance to get a little closer to their little one. Scans include an early pregnancy scan to reassure, a dating scan to more accurately predict a due date, a gender scan to determine the sex of the baby, and a 3D or 4D scan to see their baby in amazing detail. To find out more, check out their website www.nibabyscan.com or call them on 07 887 630 739. 
Uh, hi everyone and welcome back to part two of the Craig Newby interview special. Um, now we're going to focus on uh, a bit of his career as a coach. Uh, recently he's just been announced as the Ulster skills coach for the 21-22 season. Um, so we're going to chat a bit about that. Uh, Ollie, do you want to start us off there? I will, surely, yeah. Uh, so, obviously, this is we're very excited to have you over in Ulster, Craig, uh, but it's not your first uh, coaching job. And I was just wondering, how do you find coaching compared to playing in general? Like, uh, would you get the same buzz off winning a game? And also, would you have the same relationship with the lads? Or would it be more of a teacher-student kind of relationship you have these days? Um, I think... I think the bottom line for me is I like being part of a team, like team sport, whether it's winning, losing, or it's touring or just training or just improve. I, I like being part of a team. I like the, the friendships you have and, and kind of feel like I've been lucky with the teams I've gone to where even coaching wise, I guess it's, it's about setting a good culture and environment. I've, I've touched on that a few times, but it's so important. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. You've got to enjoy turning up to work and, um, yeah, I guess that's that's a big draw card to me to the sport. Rugby is one of those those teachers that gives you life lessons and just in humility and respect. And um, if you work hard, then you you know you're going to get rewards. So I've, I've kind of transferred that from my playing days into my coaching style. Um, and yeah, and, and that's where I'm at, I suppose, with that with coaching. Yeah, that's interesting. Good stuff. Might have to follow up. Questions I end up the old two part questions get me. <laughs> uh, Graham, do you want to go next, sir? Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what your um, what's your best night out after a rugby game? <laughs> <laughs> um, best night out. So probably. I know we used to so at Leicester we're always pretty good we used to um we used to go to a pub called the Coach and Horses which is in my little village in a place called Kibworth uh, just outside of Leicestershire uh, Leicester and um quite a lot of us live sort of south Leicester around the area and we used to go into the Coach and Horses a lot of the time and the guy Andy who ran it was a proper old old school publican which was kind of pushed you know you you could kind of do not what you wanted but you could just be yourself and he wasn't going to take photos and he wasn't going to spread rumours and tell you, you know, like if someone was asleep in the corner or, you know, if something else happened, he, he was pretty good like that. So we used to spend a lot of time in there as a group and guys like um, Tom Croft, Ben Youngs, Matt Smith, Boris Stankovic, Scott Hamilton, Aaron Major, you know, we were so, um, Ben Herring, uh, Jordan Murphy, Johnny Murphy, oh, yeah. um, just a real good Toby Flood, just we used to always go, nearly every game would go there and just unwind. And often, sometimes if you had like a, a week off, a weekend off or something, we'd do a Sunday and, and just sort of, that was probably more special to those nights out. We weren't really a, a night club kind of culture team. We were more of a, just a, a beer and get the music going. And um, we always had the girls, you know, the partners around and the kids. And it was one of those kind of, I think that was really special about those time. The time we had a list, we had obviously a class squad, but it all got brought together. I think because of that pub, um, I've had some pretty good ones. Recently, not so good because of lockdown and stuff. But me and my missus have got quite good at drinking. Um, we we got quite into into spice rum, so dark rum. So that's been quite of our. Um, yeah, we've been trying a few of those over the last twelve months, which has um, yeah been quite good. Yeah. Um, on the topic of alcohol, there, um, you've won, you've won a few man of the matches in the Premiership in your time. Uh, what what does it taste like? The the bottles they give you, what's actually in it? <laughs> oh, I've not won that many. Uh, mate, the old, you know, it's like the fly half kicks all the penalties. He he gets the or, or a prop makes one line break and he gets the you know like <laughs> flankers make flankers make thirty tackles a game, mate. They don't get a look in, but um. Mate, that, that bottle, I remember that Aviva bottle of like champagne or whatever, that was pretty average. Right, yeah. Know, that one. Pretty, pretty, pretty rank. Um, but I, I'm kind of simple. I'm a simple drinker. I, I'll go. So Jordan Murphy, 
I didn't. I come over here, and Jordan Murphy was our cap was the captain. No, it was actually Martin Corey, but Jordan Murphy got me into it. And he said, "Do you like Guinness?" And I said, "No, nah, I don't really. I've never really had it." And he said, "Well, I'll give you a, t- a trip." Uh, so we went around to the pub, and he said, "We're going to drink Guinness until you like it." And I didn't like the first one, and didn't really like the second one. And by the third one, I'm you know like we're playing a game where you know, you've got to get down to the top of the harp or whatever it's called. And I remember challenge. just yeah, 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 and. After that, I was, I was kind of, oh, this is not a bad drop, actually. So I'm kind of simple. I go, my, my philosophy now is, um, is Corona's like religiously 12 months of the year, but mainly Corona's in the summer, Guinness in the winter. Um, and I kind of stick to that winning formula. Um, so I'm pretty pretty simple on, on what I drink, but um, Corona's are, uh, yeah, three, six, five days of the year, Corona's are my, my thing. It's hard to disagree with that. Um Another question here I've got about your coaching. Um, so obviously you're the skills coach for Ulster next season. What does that actually involve you doing in the club? And is there any players specifically that you're looking forward to work with? Um, yeah, they're great questions. Actually, I'm I'm really lucky. I think I'm lucky. I think the club's lucky. Dan McFarlane, um, as head coach, has, has transformed the way they think on and off the field. So... You know, they've always had quality players and quality set up and tradition strong and, and clubs that have tradition and and play with it on their back, you know, are always always in a good place. I think Ulster Rugby have got that. Um, but I think they're very lucky and he sets a really nice culture. And part of the process of me interviewing and, and the conversations I've had through that and since they've all been around, um, just adding my personality and my skill set to what they've got there um, to complement the other coaches. Um, so really, they're very lucky with the, the coaches they've got. They work extremely hard and extremely well together. And so my role as a skills coach is to support them, support the players. So if, you know, the way that they're going to attack or the way they defend or their set piece, if they need support, making sure that they're all on the same page and just making players better, you know, whether they're a player or whatever their position is. So I'm, I'm going to try and try and do that. I've got a bit of a philosophy on skills and it's multi-dimensional. Um, you can't just say, right, let's practice passing, stand there and pass. Yeah, you'll get better at passing, but can we add pressure? Can we add decision-making? Is there stuff we can do off the field? Um, I'm quite big on information processing. So what you actually see, so part of your Vision is a really big part of skills because if you don't see what to do or how to execute or when to execute, there's no point being really skillful. So I'm all about multi, um, you know, like hitting at different multi multi avenues and finding what works for that individual player. Um, but my yeah, my biggest role will just be supporting what the what the team needs to execute their plans. Um, and like I said, Dan's he's very 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 good. He's given me kind of an open you know, these are things we do really well and we want to continue doing, but these are some areas that I'd like you to explore and um, and add, add your your twist on them. So uh, that's probably the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is just um, is just adding value, really. Uh, is there any stuff. players uh, specifically you look forward to working with or is it just kind of a collective group? Um, I guess, so... Looking at the squad, they've got a real mixture of some really young talent. The outside backs, you know, are looking like they could be really special, a special group. You know, Rob Balakoon and um, Mike Larry, and then you've got, you know, kids like um, Aaron Sexton coming through and Rob Little. And, you know, I'd love to get hold of those guys and, and just sort of help them, you know, with their potential. So it's not always just about um, being, you know, like, a good player, you've got to work out how, how to play and all those sort of things. I'm looking forward to working with Sean Reedy and Geordie Murphy um, and Nick Timoney, you know, their back row, really like yeah. quality players. So I'd love to, to work with them. Guys like Rob Herring and uh, Ian Anderson, um, Alan O'Connor, you know, some of those experienced guys, I'll be learning so much off them. You know, Ian Madigan, um, you know, uh, Jacob Stockdale, some of their m- more experienced players. So they've played way more rugby at the highest level than I ever did. So I'll be learning more off them and picking their brains and trying to work with them to help the young guys. And so, yeah, there's a real excitement in that to meet a lot of those guys. But um, 
yeah, I, I suppose um, yeah, I'll, I'll have a remit from no matter what position you are, I'm going to try and help you out. Good stuff. Just, uh, just one more question from myself then. It's uh, Ulster against Leicester in the, the Challenge Cup semi-final. Um, so that's obviously a tough one to pick who you're going to support in that one. Uh, how would you like to see that one go? Um, uh, Ulster, to be honest. So Yes. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, eh? Like, I, I've always watched Ulster play games. I've, I've, I never played against Ulster. Um but I've always watched them and, you know, you watch these other teams. I'm also lucky. My brother-in-law plays for Munster. Um, so I watch a lot of their games and I've, um, so I kind of have an appreciation of them, but through this whole process of, of planning now and, and conversations with coaches and, um, you know, the, like Dan and Dan Soper and, and Jared and Roddy and that, I've just become really passionate about, sort of starting, my journey doesn't start in July, it's kind of starts now, I'm doing loads of research and watching the games and watching trainings and, and trying to get a real good understanding of what they're trying to achieve so that I come in ready to go. So I've kind of got that kind of attachment already whilst it's very, very young and um, in, in, in our relationship, I suppose. But um, but conversely, I support Leicester every week through the thick and thin, and there's some bad times and some tough times and there's some light at the end of the tunnel for them. So. I guess I'm in a win-win position. It'll be nice for them to um, start getting some reward for you know the the positivity that they're getting, finally getting to off the field and on the field. So that'll be quite nice. So I'm in a win-win. But if it came down to it, I'll also. Good stuff. Hopefully we'll all be happy then. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to sneak. Um, I'm trying. To Uh, yeah, Craig. Um, last question for myself here. Um, it's a fairly simple one. Uh, Get a um, job. I'm going to try. Um, I've got a mate who works up there. So I'll watch it again. It's Friday. Right. Have I frozen? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're back, back now. So. <laughs> uh, would, you, would you repeat that last bit first, please, Craig? What last bit? You didn't even ask me. I, I didn't ask you a complete. Completely, Jack. All right. Um, yeah, so pretty much the last question I've got here for you then is uh, who's your GOAT? GOAT as a player or as a coach or what or anything? Uh, player and coach, actually. Uh, Jonah, Jonah <laughs> Lomu's a GOAT. Jonah Lomu changed, changed the world. Um, just no one since or I mean there's some close you know um semi red Rajra is unbelievable there's a couple of um you know like there are some freaks out there but he changed he changed rugby for the best he was global and just an unbelievable human um so Jonas my goat as a player um I don't really coaching wise I'm, I'm a bit a bit young really and but I'm still researching but I, I like listening to a lot of podcasts and a lot of, I read a lot of books about different styles. So I am trying to, um, trying to emulate some of the, some of those cool things I read, but I've got to, I can't, I can't do anything without my parents, you know, my dad and my mum, um, you know, as supporters, they're, they're probably my, my goats, you know, just, just rocks of, of humans and just giving me a really good platform to, to do what I want to do. Finish on that. Um, and I think that's all the questions we've got uh, for now. Um, Graham's got a little surprise for you. I think they'd like to share with you. Yeah, so <laughs> Craig, I say this most weeks, but I've wrote you a poem. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I, you can definitely hear me now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> Are you ready? I can't believe we've done this. I can't believe you're here. We've got a former All Black for you all to hear. So I can't believe we've done this. Can't believe you're here. You're coaching Ulster Rugby, our favourite team here. You played for Leicester Tigers, Highlanders too. Our World Cup 7 medal, which isn't too bad too. Thanks for coming on the pod. We wish you all the best. Give us a shout out to your boss, Dan, and maybe Stockdale too. Wow. <laughs> 
That's good. Yeah, well done. That was great. I'll, I'll just tell you now, that's the best one yet. So take from that what you will. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that's nice. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate the words. Boys, I appreciate the time. I know, um, you know, working these things out sometimes can be a bit niggly, but um, just thanks for the support, really, I suppose, already. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you very much for coming on and uh, all the very best now. Um, it was brilliant to speak to you. Yeah, no worries. All the best with the podcast and uh, I'm sure it'll go well. You've, you've got good, good grounding. Good, good lads. Well researched and uh, good humour, so can't complain. Thanks, great. Uh, thank you very much, Ollie, for coming on and being great as usual. No problem, Chubby. And thanks very much, Mr. Crawford, for that lovely piece of poetry at the end and your great questions. Thank you, Chappie. It was good to be on. Yeah, uh, so that's all Check for us. One last party. What's Sorry. That, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't think we can hear you at all. <laughs> Do all that. Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Go for it. There's a, there's a lad I coached at at school and he plays for wasps now his name's kieran curran google him yeah. he looks like graham oh is, is he a good looking man is he a good player yeah he's a he's all right he's only young still but he's, he's a good player he's a blind side flanker kieran curran okay yeah. um plays at wasps i've been thinking the whole time we've been chatting who you look like and i've just come up with it yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. All right, yeah. Thanks very All much, right. Craig, for joining us. Cheers, lads. Cheers, Craig. Bye. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, and keep an eye out uh, the next couple of weeks for some more pro baller interviews. Thanks for listening.